Well, hello. Thank you for being here. Welcome to all of you. So glad you're joining us today. It's another episode of the Nonprofit Show. I might have checked our spreadsheet this morning, Julia, and we're at 644. So episode number 644 coming up soon to 650, which is going to be another big milestone. Uh, today we have with us back by popular demand to talk to us about understanding first generation donors is Yanni. So, so thrilled to have you here. I already love your energy, your positivity, like you're just, you're very passionate and that, that comes through. Yanni uh, San Luis is the win woman, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about what that is, but we're going to learn a lot about Yanni uh, when it comes to first generation donors. So before we jump into this conversation with her, we want to remind you who we are. So hello, so very uh, much to Julia Patrick. CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I love your leopard print there. It's like, wow, it's just, it's, it's powerful. It's a bit much, but I have an animal event thing too. Oh yes. Today. So I, have I want to apologize. Acknowledge yourself. This is That's right. <laughs> oh, it's not my favorite, but it, <laughs> it serves a purpose. <laughs> Own that power. I love it. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group, and I'm always honored to serve alongside Julia uh, for the co-host here at the Nonprofit Show. We're also grateful to have the ongoing support, the investment, the trust that we have with our presenting sponsors. So thank you so very much to our friends at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy with National University, Be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Nonprofit Nerd. These companies keep us going, working towards our 650th episode. We're not stopping. Uh, we are really just continuing as we grow and evolve these conversations. Speaking of these conversations truly have evolved over the course of this journey. So three plus years, you can find all of the archives on many of these entertainment streaming channels. Those include Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. But wait, there's more. I'm not selling a sham wow, but I am encouraging <laughs> to go to your podcast. I do love those sham wow commercials, those. Uh, so listen to the nonprofit show wherever you stream your podcast. Um, Yanni, I always like to, to ask our guest, are you a podcast listener? Do you listen? I am. I am yeah. very much a podcast listener. I love it. Yeah, me too. It's usually uh, when I'm traveling or getting ready for, for the day, as well as, you know, walking my dog in the morning. So, <laughs> hey, you can listen to us and as well as today's episode that we have with Yanni San Luis, founder, CEO, the Win Woman. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Jared. And thank you so much, Julia. It's a pleasure to have, to be here this, uh, this afternoon here on the East Coast and looking forward to the conversation today. Well, we were so impressed when you were on the first time. And so we just had to get you back on for a really specific discussion about first generation donors, um, because I think it's just such a, an important topic and we don't always chat about it. But before we like get you on the hot seat, you are um, a professor at a university in Southern Florida talking about marketing, and then you also have your own firm, The Win Woman. Tell us what The Win Woman does. Sure. Thank you so much, Julia. So we here at The Win Woman, we are a social impact firm, and what we do is that we help nonprofit organizations and corporate foundations maximize their revenue, their impact, and effectiveness. We do this through a variety of ways, whether it's turnkey fundraising campaigns, CRM optimization, board management, or restructuring of their organizations. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. A lot. <laughs> it's a lot of things. It's like a little departments that I have within our firm that take care of all these beautiful things for nonprofits. Yeah. That's fantastic. Wow. And it's I so needed. It. And you're joining us today from Florida. And we also want to recognize that we are in currently Hispanic Heritage Month, and we couldn't have planned this any more properly and better. So we're just going to own that, as you had said. Um, but we're going to talk today about understanding the first generation donors. And I'm curious to learn more about this from you. Can you mm -hmm. share with us, you know, like, like what that really means at the beginning, and then we'll jump into legacy. Well, absolutely. So just to share with everyone here. So 
first generation as it relates to here in the United States are Americans who are the first generation in their family born in this country to immigrant families, right? That's basically what is the definition of a first generation American. Um, as a first generation American myself, um, I was born to uh, Cuban parents. I was born here in Florida. And essentially when we're talking about first generation, a lot of times we're thinking through um, you know, scholarships, if it's basically uh, through university systems and things like that, where um, first generation scholarships, a lot of times state matching comes in. Um, there's a variety of different things that can happen philanthropically. Uh, but we, a lot of times, and I'm very passionate about this topic because um, in my background with the things that we do within our firm, but also in my experience, um, we've served a lot of majority minority institutions or nonprofit okay. organizations. And we often discount, we think first generation and we think um, underprivileged, impoverished, um, the, the members of the community we're serving, but not necessarily those members of the community that can give. And that's where I'd like to dispel that myth here today. Let's do it. Love it. <laughs> I, I love because you are right. We, we have these tropes and we think that, you know, um, our newest citizens or members of our community are the ones that we're, you know, lifting up or supporting. Mm -hmm. And it is just not the case. Right. So let's get into it and, and kind of talk about how legacy wealth is new mm -hmm. and different and you caution us to be patient. Absolutely. What does that mean? So patience, I mean, a lot of times patience is definitely a virtue. And as a fiery, you know, Cuban Latina over here, um, that's not necessarily some things that I have enough time for on an, an average day. However, I will say, here's what we're looking at as far as trends here. And I'm thinking through for you all to think through, you know, when we're looking at and we're backing up and saying, you know, Hispanics right now are one of the fastest growing demographics here in the United States. So we can't discount the fact that what generationally where they come from, but here's where, where, where we want to start thinking through what our planning around first generation can look like, because here's the thing growing up as a first generation um, Hispanic. One of the things that I realize is that there is legacy that I have to now carry on in my family's name. And in the sense of my family came to this country for a better betterment of career, wealth, for, for you know, everything that encompasses what it is truly to le live in a free country, in, a, um, in an American society, follow the American dream. With that comes your own almost like you're born with the fact that you have to do better than your parents did. So you yeah. have already a legacy mindset where you have yeah. to even think through how do I move the needle? How can I make this situation better than what my parents and my families before me had gone through? So legacy is already ingrained in the mindset. It's just a matter of how you prove as an, a nonprofit organization that those dollars should be able, that you can be the, per, the people that are good stewards of that of those dollars. So it it starts can start small from annual giving donors. And I've seen it very much so where annual giving donors can start grow into major donors and then go into principal giving and so on for, for the future. I love that you said that you explained that, that you're the drive to be <laughs> engaged in this legacy um, concept mm -hmm. and approach is fascinating. And I haven't ever really heard anyone no. talk about that. Um, could you give us an idea? Like, are you saying that <laughs> these things change and that first generation is going to be more interested in philanthropic endeavors when they're maybe in their thirties or forties or fifties or sixties, or do you have a sense of that trajectory? Yeah, I can just share with you, especially right now, as far as, and these are just the young, younger demographics where we're talking about under 40 right now. Right. Wow, so okay. I'll, I'll share, you know, under 40 is what we're looking through as far as first generation, um, and here's where I see, I mean, the legacy component within making sure that your sole purpose 
right of you being now you know following on your legacy of of your of your family um is ingrained at the dinner table i mean when you're five i'm talking ladies this is something where it's like there is very much a lot of times that and my hispanic and La, La, latinos and even black americans will likely agree with us and wrote with me when i say that even my grandmother my abuela fifi abuela's a grandmother in spanish would tell me, you know, I did not immigrate to this country for you to X and then drop <laughs> guilt of whatever. There's so it was. much pressure in that. I can it feel it. It is. Money. It is. I, I was it like, is. oh, oh. <laughs> and that's and it, it was one of those things. Wow. And it was like, and, and it came to grades. It came to, you know, one of the things that we had in the in the chatter behind scenes. It's like the way that you show up, right? Yeah. You just couldn't, you had to be, you know, your best Think faster. You had to be put your best foot forward, and you're thinking of legacy. You wake up and you're thinking of legacy. And it's just a matter of you know we have to think through how are we going to how do we make our families proud? And it is a pressure. If you all have watched the, the Disney movie Encanto, that is real. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that pressure is real. And I just share yeah. with you that it's just a matter of how we dial it back, but also how we zero in on yeah. what the legacy can be. So maybe we we first establish it. And what's beautiful about targeting first generation donors is that nonprofit organizations can have the opportunity to actually co-create this with yeah. the, the the donor themselves and 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 cement. I mean, there's a way different ways that we can do this and and endowments become things that can live on in perpetuity are beautiful sentiments and tributes that can be placed and really work in tandem with you know the dreams of, of these of these individuals. Yeah. Wow. Well, talk to us about, uh, and thank you. First of all, I want to yeah. honor, thank you for sharing that um, and relating it to a Disney movie because that to me <laughs> is very, very understandable there. Um, but talk to us about how tithing might be a legacy expectation and how that, you know, the faith tithing in particular might look different for these generations. Absolutely. So when you're talking about faith-based and faith tithing, that's very traditional within um, within first generation families. It's very much that is the legacy I would say that exists is that faith-based tithing. However, now when we are looking at millennials started shifting this generation Z even more so has shifted this uh, dynamic. I know that here in Florida we have an incredible resource called the Florida Nonprofit Alliance. And recently they did a research report of a giving report on the way that um, this ties in, in in younger generations. And right now, um, younger generations are, they're giving in, in, different, in different spurts. So they're not just committed to one organization, they're committed to multiple, mm -hmm. usually are responding to um, justice causes and racial justice causes re more recently. Um, but here's the thing, they're giving through apps, crowdfunding campaigns, yeah. Yeah. greatest need type things. And so we need to kind of dispel that, you know, it's just automatic you know, faith-based tithing is automatic. It's not, it's still very much, how are we making a case? If you are a faith-based organization, nonprofit, we have to th still think through that our cultivation and discovery strategy needs to shift. We cannot operate from a space of arrogance that we think that, you know, the legacy is going to follow us with the younger generations. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was curious if this legacy expectation and obligation, because I see this so, so often with multi generations, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of culture is, you know, are you seeing Yanni that individuals are expected to give to the same places that their previous, you know, family members were giving to, or is it just the sheer act of giving? So here's the thing about first generation to begin with, when you're coming and this is going back to that patience piece that we talked about at the beginning. What happens here is that the first things, the, the legacy here, as it relates to um, any type of giving comes and derives from the religious faith-based giving. If there is any giving, a lot of times it it's, it's, it's tied to tithing, right? Yeah. However, when you're coming into the United States and, or, or, you know, you're a first generation born here in the United States, 
giving is not in, in the way, in the traditional sense of philanthropic giving, um, is not necessarily something that maybe you grow up with very formally, where your family, you know, writes a check every single month. It's not very standard. So it's almost like you have to back it up and have to almost educate mm -hmm. why philanthropic it becomes a very full service approach where why philanthropic giving impacts different levels, right? Because at first, again, your legacy here is to do better than what my family, why my family came here, right? That's, that's the first piece. But you have to almost start tying in with first generation donors, why giving number one is a is a tax strategy it's, it's part of your financial wellness and you know can cement your legacy we have to start being a little bit more patient in that regard but i tell i share that with you because that's the tie-in you have to there the legacy giving that existed was usually religious faith-based legacy for family it's more new when it comes here, when it's more regular. Now you start to see more second, third generation Americans, then you know, start seeing the the um the sprouts essentially of of the legacy for, for second, third. But first, you're still having new, you have you still have to navigate through the newness that exists and have to back it up and just really establish, you know, what what's possible here. So let me ask you this, given that, and I, I love that you shared with us that trajectory and the foundational piece of that. This makes me think of this question for you, and that is, it, are these first generation donors going to be more interested in faith-based organizations or faith-based founded organizations or something that has a tie maybe to refugee services or things of that nature? Or do they move away from that and want to do something different? Not necessarily. I think that's a great question. So what we're seeing a lot of times right now is that it might start with faith-based organizations because that's something that is just, mm -hmm. you know, within your family. However, it starts kind of spreading out and starts growing branches in different, in different regards. And it's a matter of like, for example, you'll see systems of higher education where, um, there is a lot of affinity. Where are some affinity groups that they, as they're starting to progress in their levels of career and service, that they feel almost like they, they feel like they owe their success to, right? And I say that because I look at, I look at my own alma mater of Florida International University. And I think about those were the stepping stones for my university, you know, my university career that gave me, you know, what I have today. So it's almost like I, I owe my success to these things and therefore I'm going to give back to the things, pay it forward to the things that have, that I've owed my success to. And so you're that type of organization. You have a lot more, um, almost like when you're talking about like the lifetime giving of a donor with, with nonprofit organizations and for, with first generation donors, you'll have a, 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 a longer trajectory with these donors. Should you be part of that success story? And that's how the questions that you have to start thinking for yourself is, how do we amount to their success and how can we make the case that, you know, we've, we're able to get you from point A to point B and kind of integrating that into the messaging so that you can start really um, defining and bringing up and, and re-engaging. You know, we are very relationship driven here um, as first generation donors. And I don't mean to be the spokesperson person <laughs> as a first generation myself, however, because I've raised a lot of money uh, from these communities um, and being myself also, I'm just speaking from my, that perspective. However, I will share that it's very relationship driven here in the sense that we expect a very high touch approach in the way that you are communicating, you're being transparent, um, you're sharing your, you're sharing your milestones, your impacts, you know, the impact reporting becomes very much, you know, we want to have in-person meeting, there is a way of the, you know, we build trust. So cultivation is incredibly important with this group and um, not coming in where you're swooping in when they've amount to success, but helping them and being 
through, you know, being part of that success trajectory is where you'll start seeing um, a lot more gains for organizations. Wow. And engaging, as you were saying, like uh, through the journey. Um, Talk to us about how these first generation donors are giving more than money. They're giving, I mean, what are they giving? Real estate? We have here stocks, art collections. What are some of the assets maybe that they're considering? Absolutely. So when I was a first, uh, when I was a frontline development officer, I was handling a lot of individual giving and, um, and corporate giving as well. And and a lot of the corporate decision makers were first generation themselves as well. And so here's what happens here, where you start wanting to plan and want to just start first with what is possible when giving. So here's where you can get creative when you're structuring gifts. So you don't have to just structure it just cash base. You can, you know, think through, we had at one point, I was working with a major university and we had very much an aggressive endowment strategy, right? We wanted to um, increase the endowment. We wanted to ensure that increased legacy. And a lot of organizations have that goal, but here's how we, we structured gifts in, in a variety of different ways, whether, you know, we sat down with the donor, many jo- first generation, and we were thinking through where we wanted to plan for their future. We were talking about legacy conversations on what their legacy was going to be like, and just knowing that what is possible, because a lot of times they think, well, I have to give millions of dollars to name a <laughs> building, or I have to do all these things. But if you can say, okay, well, we're going to take a percentage of this gift this is going to be cash. And then the remainder, you know, I have a stock, I have some stock options with the company I'm with. I'd love to trade that in for you. Or I can, um, I have some real estate, I have an art, I had, there was an art collector, a donor that we had that had an entire art collection that we ended up valuing. And it was close to $1.2 million. And here we are. And these are things that now become revenue that we can now use as assets for other things. So Mm -hmm. I tell you that I think you have to first start, and this is where the partnerships really work very handy. Um, My recommendation is always to think through where your wealth managers and partnering with financial institutions, um, getting to know your, your wealth advisors, wealth financial wealth management advisors, and think through what bringing them in as a partner, as a corporate partner, which is a great uh, fundraising philanthropic strategy, and then helping them craft alongside you this journey of helping these donors, these first generation potential donors figure out what their wealth, you know, how they can multiply their, if you're the one that helps them figure out multiplying or, you know, and, and expanding their wealth, they're going to be able to pay it forward back to you. And that's where we can get creative with the ways that we can structure these gifts. But it starts first with education and thinking about what's possible. Yeah. And I can imagine too, that's the transparency piece of let's be transparent. Let's share exactly with these individuals, you know, where their wealth of any size, because I also love Yanni. I love when people are like, oh, I'm not a philanthropist. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. but do you give? Because there is no dollar amount in the definition of philanthropy. So giving in a transparent level for these expectation, how are you seeing this is resonating now with these first generation donors? Absolutely. I think that what ends up happening, and this is going going back to the analogy that I shared earlier, which was that a lot of times for first generation, when you're thinking about an endowment of some kind, you think about, wow, I have to give X amount of dollars. What's that in cash? What's that? You know, they're starting to think about the zeros and like, when am I going to be able, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that in my generation. But if you're able to walk them through and say, here's the thing, we don't need all the cash up front. This is what we need first to get the endowment started. And this is where you can quarterly make, you know, to, to grow it. And then let's think about strategies to be able to grow this. A lot of times you end up, you know, one of the donors that I had at one point ended up wanting to honor uh, his grandparents and wanted to name an endowment um, to impact first generation uh, scholarship recipients and things like that, that, you know, for students essentially. And 
part of the first conversations was all about, well, you know, I'm not even sure if I have the, the financial capital. And you're like, wait a second, you're a business owner. Let me kind of break it down in quarters for you in the way that this can look. This is the percentage up front. How about we start here? And, and just really, again, being transparent about the process and what we don't want to feel. And a lot of times what, what first generation donors don't want to feel is that they don't want to feel stupid. So I feel like if we can think through just making it simple and easy in the ways that, you know, giving can come in a variety of ways is time, talent, and treasure. We gradually move through those cycles. But if we can think through, again, what the transparency is and also be meet them where they're at. A lot of times within the pandemic, you know, checking in with them if they're having some financial hardships or whatever it is and saying, you know, we can pause this for a second. And before they ask you to do it helps in that transparency as well. So it's a one, you know, it's, it's not a one way street. We want to make sure that the relationship is, uh, is fruitful, but that you're constantly, you're com- communicating with honesty, you're communicating with transparency and you're, you know, you're trying to help them and making it work for both win-win for both. Yeah. Love it. Yanni, I have a question and, and I'm, I'm very vulnerable in asking this, but um, how can we uh, be culturally sensitive when we're stewarding these donors uh, without having that same cultural tie? You know, I think a lot of the piece, and this is, this is something and doesn't get old, I have to share, is recognizing and coming up into a donor and saying, you know, my apology, you know, not even apologies, but saying, I might not know about this, but can you share a little bit more? Can you, can you, can you think through, like, can you walk me through what it was like to, or, Mm -hmm. and I think that you start with the story. I feel a lot of times it is, um, you know, here, here in South Florida, um, the first generation immigrant story is a dime a dozen, frankly, because there's so many of us, right? (laughs) There's a lot of, we are the, we are a majority minority, um, demographic down here. That's, that's the reality of where we live, right? We are majority minority and the majority, everybody, a lot of people are first generation, right? So the storytelling there, um, you know, right. You know, the, the, the same story, the thing, but how, but I will tell you each time that the story is told it's unique and it's almost like it, it resurges, um, their family legacy at that point. So it's even first starting with, tell me a little bit about your background, but tell me about how your family came and what is, what did that look like? And what did it look like for you growing up? And tell me what it, you know, after college, what was your, what was your story after that? Tell me like really asking the questions and understanding because at at every level, the truth of the matter is that regardless of the background that we come from, we all have very similar ways that we've maybe were brought up um, that we can tie in. Um, I know that a lot of times, probably even earlier in this call that I resonated with, you know, a grandmother or a family member that said, you know, I didn't do all these things for you to do X, right? We can Mm -hmm. resonate with those, with those um, scenarios as well. And so I feel like you just have some compassion with yourself first. Um, But I also just feel ask the question. um, And just, you know, if you feel just, I don't want I don't want this to come across as, you know, ignorant. I just want to make sure that I'm getting this correctly. And I think that that's appreciated as well. Um, Just, you know, we don't expect for everyone to know it all. (laughs) Yeah, no, thank you so much. And all of this has been fantastic, you know, and and I love the stories you talk to about the relationship. Uh, We talk often about that return on relationships. So Yanni, thank you for for shining the light on this and and sharing with us. And again, all of our viewers and listeners, we do want to recognize that we are currently in Hispanic Heritage Month. So this is a perfect opportunity uh, to have you on and learn more about first generation donors. Yanni, you have been a fabulous guest once again. So I want to say thank you to Yanni San Luis, founder and CEO, the Win Woman, uh, winwoman.com. It's just been a pleasure to have you here. I also want to make sure that we thank all of our supporting uh, partners in the journey of the nonprofit show. As Jarrett mentioned, we are marching towards 650 episodes. So we want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, 
Fundraising Academy at National University, your part-time controller, be generous, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit thought leader. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out, and we are so full of gratitude for them to be with us. We actually ask our executive producer to uh, log us off, if he will, after I give us this reminder to stay well so you can do well. Ladies, thank you so much. For